Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Marty Ross and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross MD tonight. Uh, this is a webinar where we talk about Lyme disease and uh, no two webinars are the same because you create them with your questions. So every week is a little bit different. So this is all driven by your questions. Um, you can learn a lot by asking questions, but also you can learn a lot by just listening to the responses I give to some of the questions that are asked as well too. Um, so for those of you that are new here, uh, the way you participate is uh, over here on the bottom side of the right hand side of the screen is a chat box. OK, so you write your question to me in that chat box and uh, eventually I try to get to all of them. I, I won't get to all of them because usually there are just too many uh, questions that are asked in the course of the webinar tonight. For those of you that are uh, coming back again, I'm glad you keep coming back. I, I hope everyone keeps getting value out of these. I, I think they do because I keep hearing good, positive responses about them as well, too. Bear with me just a minute. I gotta, I gotta adjust my camera. I'm not quite liking the angle of it here. Just a minute. There, I think that's gonna work a little bit better for me. Um, so anyhow, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you tonight from my new clinic, uh, which just opened up uh, this week. It's been a somewhat busy week here. Um, and so it's good to be back in practice again. I think many of you know about my journey of uh, medical board investigations and uh, fighting the good fight for people with Lyme disease. And here we are back again. So I'm glad to be back here with everyone, but it is a new office. I'm not quite happy with my lighting here. I mean, it's not quite turning out the way I want it to tonight, but hopefully y'all can see me uh, pretty clearly. Um, so the way during the webinar, I will post your questions on the screen. So those of you that are participating in the live version are actually going to get to see the question on your screen. I will read each question, though, because in the recorded versions, they don't show up. OK, so, yes, I am creating a recording. And tomorrow morning, uh, sometime around 9 to 9.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, um, I will send out an email that describes what we talked about tonight and then provide you a link uh, to the page where the recording is. OK, now, if you miss that webinar, or I'm sorry, you missed that email uh, about the recording of the webinar, uh, you can find it multiple places. Uh, one place you can find it is on my webinars page at treatlime.net. You just scroll all the way down to the bottom. I also post it on my Facebook page, which is treatlime.com backslash Facebook. I put it on the supplement store, which is Marty Ross MD. Uh, I'm sorry, it's called Marty Ross MD Supplements, but the URL is treatlime.com. It's on the homepage there. And you can also find it on the homepage of my practice website, uh, which is martyrossmd.com. OK, so multiple places. You can find a recording of this if you happen to miss some of the details about what I talk about tonight. OK, all right. So I think, oh, one of one of the business thing and then we'll get started here. Um, so this is the first webinar for December. And because of the holidays, this and, and some travel plans that I have in the middle of the week next week, um, I'm actually only going to be doing two webinars. OK, so that's because of the holiday and some of it's because of personal travel uh, plan that I have. All right. So um, I hope you get a lot of it tonight. And, uh, and the next one will be two weeks from now. And in the morning's email tomorrow morning, you'll get a link to sign up for the next one too, okay? All right, so with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'm wondering what you all have in store for me tonight. All right, hello, SJ. Let's see, can swelling under both ears, jaw areas be a symptom of Bartonella? Can they appear a year after possible infection? What do you think about bovine uh, colostrum as a Lyme treatment? Okay, so about the the swelling uh, under the ears and the jaw. So I wouldn't necessarily call swelling by itself a Bartonella symptom. Bartonella though can give a swelling of your lymph nodes. It can cause enlargement of your lymph nodes. And so, you know, lymph nodes are, are a part of your, your immune system that will get bigger when they're fighting infection. Bartonella is known to trigger enlarged lymph nodes. That's one of the symptoms of Bartonella. And, but usually the lymph nodes are going to can be in areas like here in your neckline, but in the back of the neckline, sometimes back behind the ears here, you're going to get them, you can get them down in your groin. You can even get them in your armpit areas too. Right. Now, sometimes that can look like swelling, but if you feel kind of deeply, you can start feeling some of those lymph nodes. And sometimes you can even get lymph nodes up in here too. So if you've got swelling in those areas, you want to feel kind of just see are there bumps under it. And if there are, you might want to talk to your doctor and see if those are lymph nodes. They can help you figure that out. Okay, so that so so enlarged lymph nodes. Um, so if you're talking about swelling, true swelling would not have the lumps of the lymph nodes in it. All right. Okay. Then, in terms of colostrum. So colostrum is a part of um, uh, mo a mother's milk uh, for a baby. Okay. 
And uh, colostrum is rich in many things that have immune system components. Um, for instance, one of the things that it can be rich in are what are a type of um, immune component called transfer factors. And transfer factors um, can help target the immune system to, cert fight, to fight certain infections. So I, I haven't found good benefit from using just colostrum, okay? I have found benefit for treating Lyme from using some of the components that come out of colostrum, and one of those is transfer factors, all right? So what transfer factors do is they're proteins that are made by uh, types of white blood cells in the immune system that I call the detective immune cells, okay? They don't fight infections, but they can see what kind of an infection is there, and they can identify where it is, for instance, all right? And so they release these uh, transfer factors, and the transfer factors basically land on these germs, and they make them so they're a bigger target, so that the immune-fighting part of the immune system can actually see those germs and fight it, all right? So there's Research Nutritionals, which is a supplement company that, that I like using, makes a variety of transfer factors, of which one of those is a transfer factor product called Transfer Factor L+. And Transfer Factor L+, has in it transfer factors that um, target Lyme and co-infection. So it has transfer factors in it for Bartonella, Babesia, um, um, Lyme, uh, Ehrlichia anaplasma, HHV6, which is a virus, cytomegalovirus, which is a virus, Epstein-Barr virus, which is a virus, and chlamydia pneumoniae um, are in the transfer factor L+. Research Nutritionals also make some other transfer factor products. They make something called transfer factor plasmic that has transfer factors in it that are specific for about 17, I believe, different viruses and a few bacteria, okay, all right? They make one called transfer factor Enviro, which has transfer factors that help target the immune system to go after environmental toxins, for instance, okay? Um, they also have a, a product called transfer factor multi-immune that basically works to turn on something called a natural killer cell, which is your front line in fighting any infections, but it's not really targeting them against Lyme. It's just kind of globally turning on these frontline immune army cells, if you will, to fight any kind of germ that might come through. That's what a transfer factor multi-immune would do, all right? So I don't use colostrum directly, but rather I use components of colostrum as supplements, all right? So let me just do a brief screen share here because um, I know I just talked about all these transfer factor products and, and what they do, and no one else publishes what they do. Research Nutritionals doesn't have it on their site, but I've written an article about it. Um, I feel like the Elizabeth Warren of um, Lyme disease plans. I have a plan for that. So let's go ahead and, and show you my plan for uh, and what I've written about transfer factors. So let me do a screen share here for you. All right, so... This is my Lyme disease information site. It's a treat line by Marty Ross, MD. I know many of you are familiar with it. Um, in terms of transfer factors, you can find an article about them either by writing the word transfer factor up here in my search box, or you can find it in my immune chapter within the treat Lyme guide. Okay, so click on that immune system and then down here somewhere, is this article called About Transfer Factors, all right? And so take a look through here. I describe a little bit more how transfer factors work. Um, and then I talk to you about what the different targeted transfer factors would do. Like, what do they hit? So transfer factor L+, plasmic, and Enviro. And then I also talk about the transfer factor multi-immune products here too, okay? All right, let me go back. All right, so I hope that gives you some useful information there. Thanks for your question. So somebody named Thesa said hello. Hello, back to you, Thesa, thank you. Hello, Brenda, hello, Dr. Ross. I have Lyme disease that is causing numb and tingling sensations throughout my body, especially in my head and face. What is the best treatment to back these symptoms off? Thanks so much for all you do. All right, so numbness and tingling are basically forms of neuropathy or nerve injury, okay? And it sounds like you've got some nerve injury of the small fibers that give you the feeling and, and sensations. So 
what we need to do, there's a two-step process. One is treat the germs that are inflaming those nerves, okay? The second part is there are supplements you can take that help repair the nerves so that they're not having these sensations, all right? So generally in Lyme disease, when we see people that have neuropathy like this, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's two germs that seem to be part of that. One is Lyme, the Lyme germ can, okay? But the second one is Bartonella. Bartonella, uh, which is one of the Lyme disease co-infections, is known to actually um, um, give neuropathy, all right? Now, Bartonella, testing for it's kind of hard. There are some newer tests that may show it, but generally when I make diagnosing Bartonella, I'm looking for a group of symptoms, all right? So the group of symptoms that suggest Bartonella um, can be a number of the following, okay? One is pain on the balls of the feet. Uh, second, which um, you can kind of, as you get up in the morning, it's worse. And then as you start walking, as the day goes on, they actually start lightening up and getting a little bit better, okay? Bartonella also can give a lot of psychiatric symptoms. So it can give ongoing anxiety, it can give depression, might even give OCD, might even give hallucinations, for instance, all right? Bartonella causes a lot of cognitive impairment. Lyme can too, but Bartonella does. And, and so when somebody's got really bad thinking problems, think of Bartonella as possibly being the, the, and part of the picture, okay? Bartonella can give a lot of lymph node swelling. I was talking about that earlier. So sometimes you see a bunch of swollen lymph nodes. And sometimes those swollen lymph nodes are deep in the abdomen. And so it gives people a lot of abdominal pain problems, all right? And then a Bartonella can give you a rash that looks like stretch marks, like the area of the skin just got stretched and parts of it broke in a sense, okay? They're all stretched out. So if you have a number of those and you have neuropathy, then you might want to start treating for Bartonella, okay? And then obviously if you have Lyme um, and you've been told you have Lyme, make sure you treat for that. The reason that I emphasize Bartonella is a lot of people overlook Bartonella. They rely too much on the testing, which is not accurate. But with Bartonella, you could do testing, great. I mean, if it comes back positive, definitely treat it. But if you have a lot of symptoms suggesting Bartonella, you gotta treat it too, okay? All right, now, number two, you wanna repair those nerves, okay? So two ways that I like, two things I like to focus on for nerve repair. Um, one is I wanna repair the nerve membrane. And the nerve cell membrane is made up of a double layer of fat. And in addition, inside those nerve membranes are energy factories called mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are found in every one of our cells in the body, okay? So they're not unique to nerve cells. But when you've got a cell that's injured, it may exhaust its energy supply too. And even the energy factories may get injured as part of this too. So the things you do to repair the energy factories, the mitochondria are gonna give more energy to the nerve cells so it can heal, okay? Also, the same things that fix the membrane of the mitochondria fix the membrane of the nerve cell. So we want to fix the membrane. Second thing we want to do is we want to work from the inside of mitochondria and from the inside of the nerve cell to repair damage too. And to do that, we like working with a good antioxidant, which is glutathione. Okay. All right. So in terms of repairing the membrane, there are about three different options you have, and they're all products by Research Nutritionals. Um, it's products that are made up of these fats that make up the membrane, okay? The newest product by Research Nutritionals is something called ATP360. And it has the fats that make up the covering, and it's encapsulated in such a way that there's good absorption of them, okay? In addition, there's uh, some additional micronutrients that the nerves need to work, including something called coenzyme Q10. Now, I would use the this ATP 360, three pills one time a day, if you are not taking something that CoQ10 blocks, and that would be two malaria treatments. One is something called a tovaquone, and something is a tovaquone with a, a proquinel, also known as malarone. So if you're either on Mepron, Malarone, Atovaquone, or Atovaquone with Proquinol, you do not want to take CoQ10, all right? So you would not want to do the ATP 360, all right? So if you have, if that's a problem, if you can't be on CoQ10, then what you want to use is another research nutritionals product called NT Factor Energy, which you take as two pills three times a day. And again, it repairs the cell membrane and it repairs the mitochondria covering and that's two pills three times a day, but it has um, does not have any CoQ10 in it, okay? So if you're on one of those malaria treatments, use the NT factor. If you're not on, and I mean, sorry, a Babesia treatment using antimalarials, use the NT factor. If, however, you are not on one of those antimalarials, um, you can use the ATP 360, which is easier to use three pills one time a day, okay? Now, 
Research Nutritionals has a third product that repairs your cell membrane covering and the mitochondria membrane called ATP Fuel, but it's a lot harder to take, and the ATP 360 was meant to replace it, okay? I'll show you a whole article about that in a minute. All right, all right. then your glutathione. You want to use a product that is a liposomal glutathione. And what that means is it's glutathione that's microscopically wrapped in fat, all right? And that's because that increases its absorption. So the product I like for that is a product made by research nutritionals called Trifortify. There's an orange flavor and a watermelon flavor. And they've gone out and done a lot of research showing that it does actually work and you get great absorption of this stuff because it's microscopically wrapped. Now, the reason you want microscopically wrapped glutathione is if you don't, in the gut, it gets destroyed. It doesn't, it's not available to be even absorbed that well, okay? Now, glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant that we make inside of every one of our cells. But when cells are damaged, they may exhaust their glutathione gas tank. So you need to put more glutathione in the gas tank, basically, okay? And um, glutathione is, is the restorative, reparative antioxidant that is made in every cell. And if it's worn down, you cannot repair these cells, okay? All right, so treat your Lyme, treat your Bartonella if you have them, okay? Secondly, get on something to repair the cell membrane covering and the mitochondria membrane covering, which would be either uh, the ATP 360 or NT factor. And then number, then, then the last part of this is be on glutathione, use a liposomal product, and I like the Trifortify by Research Nutritionals. Okay? All right. Now, if you miss some of that, let me just go back and I'm going to show you an article that you can look at that gives more of a description of this too. All right. So take a look at my online guide again. And if you look at my chapter on... Where is my chapter? On my brain and nerves chapter. Take a look at this article called Nerve Damage, How to Heal It. And basically in here, I talk about um, treating your infections. This says Babesia. I need to correct that. I wouldn't say that Babesia gives neuropathy, but definitely treat Lyme, treat um, Bartonella, okay? And then through this article, I talk about how to repair the, the membrane and the mitochondria. And I talk about glutathione in here too. I also mentioned CoQ10 and acetyl L-carnitine, but for most people, you don't need those supplements, okay? All right, let me go back here. All right, thanks for that question, Brenda. Good luck to you. Hello, Colleen, let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross, are these things helpful? Oh, you're asking me if they're helpful. Yeah, uh, okay, number one, oxygen taken through a tube in front of the nose. Number two, ionic foot bath. Number three, chi machine or whole body vibe machine. Um, okay, so my answer is, I don't think so. <laughs> to be the, the bottom line, okay? I haven't found people get much benefit from doing oxygen breathing. Uh, the ionic foot bath uh, is something that people use to supposedly detox because when they run the ionic uh, currents through the water that you put your foot in, it, it turns dirty. So that makes people think that because it's dirty, there must be toxins coming out. But there's no proof that those are toxins in there. Okay. And then number three, I have not seen anyone get benefit from a chi machine or a vibe machine. All right. So that's my opinion on those. Thank you for asking that. Good luck to you. All right, Lauren, this is a really long question. And tell you what, I'm, I'm going to just read it. I can't post it because if I post it, it's just, it's going to jam up my whole computer. Okay, I can't get back to it. So I'm going to read this one, everyone. I'll try to be pretty quick about it. See, hi, Dr. Ross. Congratulations on being back in the office. You're welcome. Uh, I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> like so many, I'm grateful for what you do. I have been following along with you or your journey since before you left in Wallen, Austin. In fact, I had the surprise and pleasure to talk with you when you answered the phone the few times I wasn't able to order online. I, I enjoyed those times when I was answering the phones for my own business. That's great. Thank you. Let's see, I'm hopeful that my question gets to you this week, and I am adding a new one regarding the possibility of coming to you. A few weeks ago, I heard you say one of the questions was a bit long and involved. This is probably one of those. It is, but I'm trying it. Let's see, but I need to know what to do, what lengths to know to what lengths we have already gone. I've been trying to help my daughter get well for past four years. I discovered 
you in August of 2018. I subscribed to your newsletters, listened to your talks, and read your book. I started my daughter on the, Rice La the Ross Lyme Support Protocol and supplemented with herbs for Bartonella, Babesia, and Borrelia. I have her on many of your protocols for managing cytokines, curcumin, NT factor, glutathione, biocytin, magnesium, and more, all of which I ordered from you. Right now, she is fo following your yeast protocol minus the prescription part. Her newest, most bothersome symptoms to, uh, since late March have to do with her eyes. She has stabbing pain behind them, frontal headaches, an extreme dry eye, and light sensitivity. At times, she has blinding white light. I did have her see a neurologist, an ophthalmologist who found nothing wrong. These symptoms would come and go, but they have remained since August. Do you have any suggestion of what might we might do differently? I'm concerned that she might be part of the small percentage who can't get well on herbals, but she does not have an MD who knows enough and would prescribe for her. We have tried to find one. If I could find a way to get her to Washington to see you, would you be able to keep prescribing medications or testing from afar? If not, it doesn't seem like it would be an easy to, to come. She lives in Southern California. Again, thank you for everything you do. You've been our lifeboat in this journey, uh, Lauren, mom of Aaron. Um, so, uh, so Lauren and, and Aaron, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about this situation that you're in. Um, you know, I haven't seen anything specific for the eyes and the kind of problem that you described there, okay? Um, but I would need to know a lot more questions about your health. I know that you've been, you know, that uh, uh, Lauren, that, that, you, that you've been helping your daughter treat for all these infections. But I would want to know from my clinical standpoint, are they there, all right? Are they the right things that you're treating? The other point that I would point out is, you know, the herbal options for killing germs uh, for Bartonella work about 70, 75% of the time. Sometimes you have to go to prescriptions. Babesia uh, and Bartonella prescription options, on the other hand, will work about 80 to 85% of the time, okay? Prescriptions for Babesia, in my experience, will work about 80 to 85% of the time. The herbs work 75 to 80% of the time. So again, the prescriptions may work better. And then finally, for, um, uh, for Borrelia, the Lyme germ, I find that my common products that I like using the Otoban Cascal work about 85 to 90% of the time. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're going to work on everyone. If they don't, sometimes we need to switch over to a prescription antibiotic regimen that also tends to work about 85 to 90% of the time. So it may be that she just needs to have an adjustment and get to the prescriptions, all right? To give you a full answer, I probably need to ask a lot of questions. There's two ways you could go about that. Number one, I could do what I call one of my visits, which is a limited consult service visit, where I visit with you online using a telemedicine platform that I have, where I visit with you by video, but you go to my telemedicine clinic online and we meet there basically, you with your camera and me with my camera, okay? Those visits, because I don't get to examine a person, I can give a lot of information, I can ask a lot of questions, I can get a lot of information, and I can give lots of advice, including even recommend antibiotics if they're needed, all right? And I could answer whether it would be beneficial for your daughter to come out here or not, okay? All right, now the disadvantage of that visit, I don't get to prescribe because I never examine the person, okay? And I can't order tests, okay? The other option to consider would be to just become a regular patient here and the, a full, what I call my full medical service visits. And with those, when I have people that come from afar, I'd like to have them seen at least one time a year uh, at the beginning and then a second time of the year about six months later. So two times a year, I wanna see a person in office. Any of the other visits we do throughout the year, we can use, we can do using my telemedicine platform, okay? And yes, I can order tests that way. And yes, I can order, uh, do lab orders if we need to as well too. So that could be an option for you as well too. So you both may wanna consider those, okay? So you can find more information about this, like what's required, the forms you need to sign. You can even set up the appointment through my appointments page at my, um, um, my clinic website. I'm gonna show you that right now, okay? Um, so bear with me here just a minute, everyone. I'm gonna do a quick screen share. All right. So this is my practice website. It's martyrossmd.com. And on the appointments page, hmm. well, that's not going good. Oh, there it is. <laughs> that loaded really slow. 
Down here, just as you scroll down, you're going to see I offer full medical service, limited consult service, and you can schedule the appointment by clicking on that button right there, okay? All right, but you need to read about the required forms and how this works. So you would come down here, and I describe everything involved in a limited consult service here, including charges, and I describe everything about my full medical service visit, including charges, down here. And in both of these, there's a section you need to fill forms out, okay? All right, so I just want to point that out. And then during the visit, before the visit, you would come here to this telemedicine clinic section here, if we're going to do it that way, and you click this Go Now button, and it's going to take you to my telemedicine clinic, okay? So that's kind of how that works. So take a look there and see if that, that would meet either, if, if doing either in office or, let me get back here. So decide, I mean, one way to try it out and see if I can help your daughter would just be to do my limited consult service visit first, okay? So I can ask a lot more questions, all right? But if you really do want to come here, I'd be glad to help out that way too, all right? All right, good luck to you. Good luck to your daughter, and thank you for that question. All right, let's see here. Hello, Mary Elizabeth. Let's see, thank you so much for offering these valuable webinars. You're welcome. Question, I need cataract surgery, but with longstanding Lyme disease, I have had lots of eye issues, including a gazillion floaters. I'm wondering about having such surgery while having Lyme, particularly any effects of antibiotics they will surely give. Do you have any thoughts about this or about people with aggravated Lyme symptoms during other surgeries? So I haven't, when I've had patients with Lyme that have had cataract surgery done, I'm just reading that again, it's cataract surgery done, I have not seen any worsening occur of Lyme after a cataract surgery, okay? So in my opinion, that would be safe to do. The thing, but regarding your question about surgeries, there are some surgeries that we will see Lyme get worsened. And these are ones where somebody is um, given general anesthesia, which means that they, General, by general anesthesia, I mean they give you a breathing tube and they have you breathe gas that paralyzes your muscles, okay? That's general anesthesia. And so if you're ready to go under go surgery, you want to talk to the surgeon, what kind of anesthesia am I getting, okay? But if they're telling you it's going to be general anesthesia, then you may need to think twice because Lyme, um, for whatever reason, most of us see that when people get general surgery, there is a worsening of symptoms afterwards. And we think it has something to do with the general anesthesia, but we don't know why, okay? Now, the other way for some surgeries that they will sedate you is they sedate you by medicines they give you through your veins, all right? They give you like a sleep medicine cocktail, all right? Those are okay. We don't tend to see Lyme get worse when you're given the sleep cocktail. But if you're given general anesthesia, the kind that you breathe in, uh, and I'm not talking laughing gas in the dentist office, I'm talking surgery general anesthesia, um, we see things get worse uh, often. We don't know why, okay? All right, so good luck to you. Thank you for that question. Hello, Alexandra. Let's see. Good evening, Dr. Ross. Since getting sick two years ago, my liver enzymes have been acting up uh, for more than a year as I got sick with Lyme. My ALT being around the 120 my LMD pr proposes to take keep pushing has it's probably the infections keeping those numbers up but what would you recommend as I'm afraid of burning out my liver huh okay I think what you're saying is your your Lyme doctor has basically said it may be Lyme that's tr causing those elevated liver enzymes and that he thinks that if you treat your infections, it might get better. I think that's what you're saying. Okay, let me talk about that real quick. So ALT and AST are two enzymes that are made by your liver. And when the liver gets inflamed, we will see that those enzymes are elevated, okay? And so when they, when they become elevated, um, that's a sign of liver inflammation. Now, Often it's drugs that we take that can lead to liver inflammation, okay? So for instance, some of the Lyme antibiotics like rifampin and uh, something called tinidazole and something called flagyl, which is also known as metronidazole, those things all can lead to some degree of liver inflammation. But also I have seen that Lyme infection leads to liver inflammation too. 
So when I have somebody that comes in initially with uh, elevated liver enzymes, I'm going to do some testing to make sure they don't have a virus cause of their hepatitis, their liver inflammation, okay? So we would want to do some testing for something called hepatitis B, hepatitis C, maybe even hepatitis A. These are viruses that can lead to liver inflammation. And if those are negative, then that would suggest a non-viral infection cause of the liver inflammation. The other thing I would do is if somebody, uh, I would also want to start somebody on something that supports the liver to get that liver inflammation down. And what I'd like to use to do that is glutathione. That liposomal glutathione that I talked with you about tonight can repair damage anywhere, okay, even inflammation in the liver. And uh, glutathione is also the master detox chemical that is used uh, within the liver as uh, well, too. And so you would want to take um, of that Trifortify product I mentioned earlier, you'd want to do about five milliliters one time a day, okay? All right? All right, now, if you do that for a month or so and your liver enzymes are not changing and you've ruled out that there is any other virus infection that might be causing it, then I do, I have in my practice then proceeded with treating Lyme with antibiotics, but usually trying to use ones that are not known to lead to liver inflammation. Because I have found by doing that, that sometimes the liver inflammation will get better. Because I think from what I've seen based on my experience, that Lyme can also trigger in some people a hepatitis, okay? So hepatitis means liver inflammation. Again, there's three viruses, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C that we can test for that cause that. But Lyme might do that as well too, okay? All right. So those are my thoughts on that. Um, good luck to you. All right. Let's see here. This is another long question. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to post it. Uh. Let's try. Here we go. No, I'm not going to. If I post it, it'll lock out my screen. <laughs> I'm going to read it again. All right. Hello, Dr. Ross. This question about my 18-year-old daughter who had a diagnosis of Lyme with uh, uh, Lyme Babesia Bartonella Mycoplasma pneumonia in 2015. She was on multiple kinds of antibiotics since August 2015, prescribed by her Lyme doctor. First two years, she was almost bedridden, but gradually got better for the most severe pain. Then she finally hit an absolute limit to take antibiotics in February this year, 2019, due to stomach pain, bloating, gas, nausea, acid reflux, loss of appetite. Her LMD didn't treat this condition, and Rx given by her primary care doctor didn't work at all. Only homeopathic meds and allergies were the key tools for some time. Finally, SIBO was found by a different integrative doctor in May. He ordered a stool test and treated her with rifaximin, followed by... Uh, an herbal protocol for a total of four months. But the second test result showed that the methane producing bacteria were still present. The integrative doctor is using the same herbal germ killer supplements that she had used during the four month treatment. So I wonder if it would be effective to eradicate the bacteria with the same tools. I would be grateful if you could give us advice is using biocide and LSF, aloe vera, GI detox and prebiotics, probiotics as effective as using the SIBO treating antibiotics. Thank you. Um, all right, let's see here. So I want to see if you said one thing here. Okay, so what I will tell you is this. So SIBO, uh, I'll try to answer it uh, as best I can, okay? So SIBO stands for small intestine bacteria overgrowth, all right? And what we see happen is that bacteria that should be living in the large intestines somehow get into the small intestines and set up shop. Now, there are, one of the ways that we can test for SIBO is to do a breath test. And you mentioned a stool test, so I'm not sure whether your doctors did the breath test or not. But in this breath test, we have you drink some sugar water, and then we measure over a period of time um, whether you're producing, uh, whether they're producing hydrogen and methane, okay? Now, hydrogen producing SIBO is fairly easy to treat usually two to four weeks of rifaximin by itself is going to be enough, okay? Methane producing SIBO is more difficult to treat. And often two months is not enough. Sometimes we need to go longer. 
one of the treatments that's recommended for um, uh, methane producing SIBO is to do a combination of rifaximin and neomycin prescriptions for two months and probably add to that mix something like a biocidin LSF, okay? Actually, I wouldn't even use the LSF. I would use regular biocidin, and I'll try to explain why in a minute. And even so, sometimes you need to repeat treat, okay? It's a complicated condition to treat when you have methane producers, all right? Now, so I would look back and see, when your doctors use rifaximin, do they do neonice too? And if they did not classify whether this was a methane producing one, I would go back and redo those breath tests to make sure that it is a methane producing one. Because if it is, that explains why it may be harder getting over it, okay? Now, the biocidin is an herbal product that has a number of herbs in it that can help with SIBO, okay? Um, but there's different varieties and ways that the biocidin is made. One form is biocidin LSF which is a biocidin liquid that is microscopically wrapped in fat, a liposomal variety. And microscopically wrapped in fat makes it so it is better absorbed, all right? But that's probably better if you have systemic Lyme. You want to get it absorbed into the bloodstream, all right? But if you've got SIBO, you want the stuff pretty much to stay in the intestines. So a better form of the biocidin to use would be either to use the biocidin capsules or the biocidin liquid, okay? Not the biocidin LSF, but there's something called biocidin liquid because they're going to stand a better chance of staying in the intestines. Okay. All right. In terms of the other, <coughs> excuse me here. I would not think of olivirex and GI detox as being helpful. And then when it comes to probiotics and prebiotics, some people with SIBO, it makes their symptoms worse, and some people, it makes them better. If you're going to do probiotics, I would suggest doing them without a prebiotic, and I would probably use the one made by Research Nutritionals, which is called Corbiotic Sensitive, okay? That would probably be the way to go, and I do about two to four of those pills one time a day, okay? All right, I'm going to do a quick screen share here for you. All right, so take a look um, in my Lyme disease site, my Lyme disease information site, there is an article I have on biocidin. And in this article, I describe the different forms of the biocidin and how you might want to use them, okay? All right, so for SIBO, I talk about using biocidin. And then down here, I talk about which form. So you can use the biocidin liquid for SIBO or the capsules. And in this article, I give you the dosing of it too. Okay. All right. Let me go back here. All right. Hold on, everyone. All right, let me go back here. All right, let me get rid of that. Huh. Got a few brief comments that weren't full questions, so bear with me here. I just got to get rid of these two questions. All right. Hello, Joyce. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. As always, thank you for being here to help us. You're welcome. I have chronic Lyme and friends, primarily, oh, <laughs> Lyme and friends, I got it, and, and primarily Bartonella. Uh, first bite, back of left armpit in 2001, and second bite 10 years uh, later, back of right armpit. Both times bullseye rash. Have you ever noted any correlation between the location of the bite and symptoms? I seem to experience a great deal of under the skin activity with itching and crawling sensations on my back and upper backs of arms. Also, aside from a round of Doxy back in 2001, I managed primarily with herbal and homeopathic treatments, always pulsing. 
What herbal remedies do you think are most effective? Do you recommend taking enzymes along with the herbs? How long for length of treatment? Thank you. All right. So, um, you know, I have seen, not everyone, but I have seen a number of people that um, basically their, um, their uh, symptoms um, were worse around the bite. Not, not all the time. In fact, not the majority of people, that's not true. Okay. But occasionally I have seen that before. Okay. And then in terms of the um, different herbal options, so it depends on which germ you're treating, okay? So if it's Lyme, my preferred two herbs to use are Otoba bark and cat's claw. If it is uh, Babesia, my preferred two herbs are Artemisinin and Cryptolepis. And if it is Bartonella, my preferred two herbs are Sida Okuda and Houtania. And rather than going through the, all the details on that, I'm gonna point you to where you can read about them, okay? So let me just do a quick screen share on that. All right, so take a look at my chapter called Infection Treatment Plans. For information about um, the herbs that I use, you can look in this article called Kills Lime, or I have a whole article just on, oh, I guess it didn't show up there. I'll show you where the article is on the Otoba and Cat's Claw in a minute, okay? And then in terms of the herbs I recommend to treat Bartonella, click on this article called Kills Bartonella Brief Guide, Look at the tier three section where I describe the herbs. For Babesia right here, click on this article and look into the article for the tier three treatments for Babesia and you'll see the herbs that I recommend there, okay? You can read about the Otoba and Cat's Claw in this article, a Lyme Disease Antibiotic Guide, or you can find a specific article I've written about them in this chapter called Anti-Germs. And this is the article on the Otoba Bark and Cat's Claw and why I use them and how successful I have found them too. Okay? All right. All right, Joyce, thank you for that question. Hello, Linda. Questions? I'm ready. Let's see. What regimen do you recommend if clearly have BART and want to eradicate, but not sure if Lyme and or Babesia is hanging around at this point? Number two, how to decide minocycline or doxy with rifampin if I really want to knock down BART? No idea if Lyme is in the background. Three, you mentioned rifampin can cause adrenal issues, and since I am so fatigued anyway, can you please recommend protocol for boosting energy and protecting the adrenals? Number four, what systemic antifungal do you recommend taking with rifampin? The azoles apparently have interactions with rifampin, but I hate to be without a systemic yeast buster. Okay, all right. So um, number one, let's see your first question. What regimen do you recommend if clearly have BART and want to eradicate, but not sure if Lyme or Babesia is hanging around, okay? So I would, for Bartonella, um, I would build a regimen at all, if you think Lyme might still be there, I would build a Bartonella regimen that can also treat Lyme at the same time. And that would be to combine rifampin, which is a great anti Bartonella antibiotic, and also can treat intracellular and cyst Lyme. And I would con uh, combine that with either biaxin, azithromycin, minocycline, or doxycycline, okay? Those four antibiotics I just talked about are great at treating spirochete Lyme and intracellular Lyme, and they help rifampin get over the Bartonella, okay? You could do any one of those four, all right? In terms of how do you cover Babesia, you would still need to use another anti-Babesia regimen, all right? But in terms of just talking about the something that might treat two germs, those combinations would treat Bartonella um, and Lyme at the same time, okay? All right, all right, second part of your question. How do you decide minocycline or doxy with rifampin if I really want to knock down BART? No idea if Lyme is in the background. Okay, so the so both doxy and minocycline can work well. The major difference is minocycline is more fat-soluble 
than the doxycycline is. And that means it can get into fatty tissues better, all right? Which means it can cross over into the brain easier, all right? So minocycline may have better penetration into the brain, crossing over something we call the blood-brain barrier. Minocycline may do a better job than doxycycline, okay? The problem is it's so good at being fat soluble that sometimes in some people it concentrates so strongly around the nerves in the brain that it gives them neuropathies actually, all right? So if you're on it and suddenly you start going numb or suddenly an arm or leg stops working, you need to come off the minocycline, all right? So just wanna make you aware of that, okay? Number three, you mentioned rifampin can cause adrenal issues. All right, so I have never seen a rifampin cause adrenal issues, okay? So that's, I, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, so I'm not sure what, I don't have a response to that, okay? And then number four, what systemic antifungal do you recommend taking with rifampin? The azoles, okay, so I I will sometimes use my azoles, like diflucan, which is fluconazole, uh, ketoconazole, uh, sporinax, which is also itraconazole, okay, the azoles. I will sometimes consider using them with rifampin, but I'm gonna adjust my dose based on the interaction that rifampin may have. But that's only if I'm gonna use them for like no longer than a month. If I'm gonna wind up having somebody um, on rifampin for longer than a month and they need to be on antifungals longer than that, then probably what I'm gonna to try to do is go more with herbal antifungals. And the one I, product I like that, I, there's a couple I like working with, but the one I think that has the strongest potential with that is uh, something called Capri Plus. And it's got caprylic acid, rosemary oil and garlic in it okay so it can be quite a nice herbal compound to help deal with yeast then okay all right and i think i answered all that oh if you're gonna do capri plus two pills um two or three times a day on that okay all right thanks for the question Hello, Molly. Let's see. Just want to say thank you for all you do for us out here in Limeland. You give us so much support and hope. Thank you. Thank you. Molly, you're welcome. I appreciate hearing that. I, I, I'll just relay a story. So, you know, as I'm getting back into practice from not doing you know, the clinical practice over the last year, uh, a number of people are coming to see me that have participated in the webinars or um, have used my resources online too. And uh, it's been kind of eye-opening to me. You know, when I when I developed all this stuff, I really, my goal was to help people, um, to give information when people didn't have information, but also to give information they could take to their doctors to get help so we could start educating doctors as well too. And you know what? It's working. I've had so many people that have come in my office this week, quite a number actually, uh, that basically have said that um, I've been the one helping them over the last year or two and the information has gotten them better, and, and they have actually, but also they've taken information to their doctors and their doctors have jumped in and helped. So all this work I put in, it, it's it helping and I, I appreciate that. One of my favorite persons was a patient I saw yesterday that um, be, before I saw her, I read the information she sent to me and she wrote me a letter about her history. And she started out the letter by saying, you may not know it, but you have been my doctor for the last two years. <laughs> and, that really touched me. That really touched me because it, it shows that all this work, hard work that I've been doing here is paying off and helping people. And that ultimately is what I want to do. So I appreciate those comments. Thank you very much. Oh, the other thing I'd point out, if, if you guys are getting help from my stuff, share it. I mean, there's so many more people out there that need help. And uh, and the best way is word of mouth. Um, so you can share the, the fact about my website. Keep spreading that because uh, it just helps me to reach more people. Okay, thank you. All right. Hello, SJ. Let's see here. Can swollen lymph nodes in Bartonella appear a year after infection? I mean, it's possible, but I, so first of all, yes, if, if Bartonella is still active, it could be triggering lymph nodes, okay? If you've treated your Bartonella and you're suddenly getting lymph nodes and you have no other symptoms suggesting Bartonella, then I start looking for another cause of those lymph nodes, like another infection, a far out cause can be cancer sometimes. I'm not saying every lymph node that's swollen is cancer. Just be careful about that, okay? But sometimes cause of swollen lymph nodes can be cancer as well too. So don't automatically assume it's Bartonella, okay? But if you have active Bartonella, you have a lot of symptoms of active Bartonella like I described in the webinar earlier tonight, 
then it's very possible that those lymph nodes could be from the Bartonella. Okay, thank you for that question. Hello, B. Thank you, Dr. Marty, for your generosity and sharing your knowledge. You're welcome. Let's see. Miss seeing your dogs. <laughs> Congrats on your new clinic. Uh, my question, have you heard of treatment with the bee venom? Know anything about it? What say you? Okay. So, B, I've written a whole article about it. Um, I'll show that article to you here in a minute. So, bee venom, probably one of the, the ways that it, it works. So, bee venom means uh, taking, getting bee stings, basically. And the bee venom itself has some chemicals in it that we think, based on science, um, leads to decreased inflammation. So that may be one of the strong ways it's working, is it's decreasing your cytokines, okay? There is some possibility it may be antibiotic too, all right? Now, I know there are some, I've had patients in my practice that have tried it that got nowhere with it, and I've had some patients that have had just marvelous results. So it's one of those types of treatments that you could try, see if it gives you benefit, there, in terms of how to do it on my article, I have a um, link to a YouTube video about how do you do uh, bee, bee, uh, bee, sting, uh, bee stinging therapy or bee venom therapy. And it's done by a person that has done this with her own care. And I think it's a pretty accurate source. And I also link you to some Facebook discussion groups too, okay? So there are some people that swear by it. I think for the majority of people, it doesn't really help that much. But there are some people, it is really the saving grace that either markedly reduces their symptoms or um, has been able to put them even into remission too, okay? So let me show you the article about that. Let's see. All right, so this is the article. It's called Bee Venom Therapy for Lyme. You can just write bee venom in the, in the search box up there, okay? And then I talk about whether it works or doesn't work and how it could help. And the big thing is, is it probably decreases the cytokines, okay? Um, and maybe it kills things, but just it's just not so sure. But there is some limited science that says that it could, okay? All right, but take a look here. I even give you the one of the resources is uh, a uh, information about the ins and outs of doing it by a person named Ellie Lobel, and I have the link right here, okay? All right, thanks for the question. Oh, one other thing. Hey guys, what are we doing here, huh? So you wanna see my dogs? I'll show you, come here. So this is Mr. Thor. He's wishing that we were out walking right now. <laughs> and Halo, his sister, is over on the side. They're both here with me. I actually um, bring them into work with me. They get to see people too. Although usually I have them in a kennel. I don't wanna have my dogs jumping all over people, but they're in the treatment room with me. And uh, a lot of people find comfort with that too. Thank you for asking about them. Hello, Frank. Let's see. Thanks for your help last time. My doctor prescribed another two weeks of Doxy plus Bactrim for a total of four weeks. I know I need longer. I just I just have Bartonella. I started having the sides of my neck slightly swollen and lymph nodes under my jaw sensitive. Is this common during treatment? I'm going to test for antibodies again to see if the tighter value varies during treatment. Does this make sense? Okay. So you may be getting swollen lymph nodes because again, Bartonella can infect down into the nodes. And as you start killing, you may be getting a killing reaction that leads to inflammation within the nodes as well too. So you can get nodes swollen because of Bartonella itself, but also the killing reaction can inflame the lymph nodes as well too. Following tighter values does not make sense during Bartonella treatment. I know some of my, some providers do that. All that that's measuring is the degree of immune reaction you're having. It, and it doesn't have any indication as to what the true load of the germ is in you, okay? So I, I don't find any benefit of doing that, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Frank. Oops, do you wanna go in there, Thor? All right, let's see here.
Hello, Dave. Let's see. Good evening, Dr. Ross. My question is, what is the likelihood of Lyme causing damage to your dopamine receptors leading to MSA? Thank you. I don't know. I haven't seen any relationship with that before. I'm not saying there can't be, but I haven't seen that described anywhere, nor have I seen any research on that. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question, Dave. Hello, Michelle. Can pelvic floor prolapse be caused by Lyme disease? Um, I have not seen it cause it. Usually pelvic floor prolapse is going to be more predominant in women that have had children as the tissues that hold the whole pelvic area together get stretched out during childbirth. I have not seen a relationship between that and Lyme or any of the co-infections. Okay. Thanks for the question. Hello, Tisa. What about systemic candidiasis? So let me try to define what people, what systemic means, okay? Some people, when they say systemic candidiasis, what they mean is a candida that is living throughout the body, like in the blood, in the tissues, etc. And what I would say is that only happens with people that are severely immune compromised, like in HIV. It is not a common thing that you're going to have happen in Lyme, okay? But systemic candidiasis can also mean a different thing, which is you have yeast candida overgrowing in your intestines, and that overgrowth in the intestines triggers the immune system to release a bunch of chemicals called cytokines. Those are inflammatory chemicals. They get into the blood and they give you most of your Lyme symptoms, symptoms that look like Lyme, okay? In addition, the yeast in the intestines can release um, toxins that also um, get into the uh, bloodstream and give you a systemic effect. So it's not yeast living in the blood or living in your system other than your intestines, but rather it's chemicals that get released by the yeast that go systemically. So those are all things that are systemic candidiasis, okay? Um, so the treatment still is to focus on getting the yeast out in the gut, basically, okay? All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Christopher. Let's see, hi, Dr. Marty. Experiencing intense knee and leg muscle pain and burning. What can I do for the pain? I'm taking liposomal glutathione, about 1,500 of lipocurcumin, which doesn't help. How do I reduce the cytokines? Thank you for all your help, Chris. So there's two qualities of pain. There's achy pain, and then there's also neurologic pain. Neurologic pain has qualities of sharp, stabbing, shooting, burning, piercing, or electric, okay? If your pain is of those qualities, just dealing with inflammation is not gonna be enough. You need to do things to block the neurologic transmission of that pain and to heal the nerves. The way you can try to limit some of the neurologic transmission of that pain can be to use low doses of antidepressant medicines, could be to use low doses of anti-seizure medicines, or you could even use um, an herb called L-theanine. Now, L-theanine is a component of green tea, and in the brain, it is turned into a chemical called GABA. And it, the brain is full of uh, GABA receptors. And if you give more GABA to a GABA receptor, it can influence pain, all right? So if you're trying to use L-theanine for neurologic pain, the way you want to do is it comes a 100 milligram pill and you can start at 100 milligrams three times a day. And if you need to over days, you can increase up to 400, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, 400 milligrams, four pills, three times a day. You don't want to go over 1,200 milligrams though, okay? 1,200 milligrams and above, there's been some linkage to cancer in some of the animal research on that. So stay under 1,200 milligrams, okay? All right, now that can sometimes help with nerve pain. If that doesn't work, then you want to look at the pharmaceuticals like antidepressant medicines or anti-seizure medicines to help with nerve pain, okay? I like that you're using glutathione. That can help with nerve pain too because it helps repair the nerves, all right? 
Um, the other thing you could add if this is nerve pain is to repair the cell membrane covers of the, of the nerves and that's to use either that ATP 360 that I talked about earlier tonight or NT factor that I talked about earlier tonight to repair nerves, okay? All right, so those are some things to think about. In terms of getting your inflammation down, I mean, you're doing some of the best things you can, glutathione and curcumin. You might want to substitute out the lipocurcumin for a product called Cytoquel. Cytoquel has some curcumin in it. It also has quercetin in it. It's got some black tea extract in it, and it's got some resveratrol in it. And these are all things that can help limit cytokine production too. And maybe you need a combination approach instead of just the curcumin alone, okay? Those would be some thoughts to think about, all okay? right? All right, good luck to you. Hello, Kathy, I see. Do you have any experience with um, mycelial mushroom extra extract in treating Lyme? No, I have not. Um, I use uh, a combination of five mushrooms called the five mushroom formula uh, by Mushroom Sciences and JHS Naturals. Um, and I also use something called Reishi. Reishi I like for treating virus infections. It boosts the immune system to target viruses. A general mushroom mix like that five mushroom formula I was just describing can boost the immune system to fight bacteria and viruses too. But I haven't done this one specifically for Lyme, okay? Let's see here. Hello, Kathy. Let's see. Our daughter has been treated. Excuse me, just a minute here. Our daughter has been treated for chronic Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, and Mycoplasma co-infections for three years with minimal improvement. Her main symptoms are brain fog, dissociation, and fatigue. She is being treated by Lyme literate naturopath for three years and the following treatments, herbal remedies and supplements, ozone, glutathione, selenium, amyco, cytoquel, ACS uh, 200, Transfer factor plasmic, megaspore, biotic, sinusitis, nose spray, low dose naltrexone, vitamin C with quercetin, trifortified orange, vitamin D, uh, MC bar 2, zinc, uh, carnosine. We are deciding if she should try antibiotics, but are fearful of some of the side effects and also research that shows antibiotics do not help chronic Lyme. What are your thoughts? Um, so, your best chance of getting over Lyme is actually the prescriptions, okay? I work with herbs all the time. But when it comes to, um, it, and especially if somebody has tried the herbal antibiotics and they're not getting better, it's time to give the prescription to run. Um, yes, there's concerns about the prescriptions, but in some people, that's the thing that turns them around. Um, they do help in chronic Lyme. Right? When we use prescription antibiotics to treat chronic Lyme, they work about 80, 85% of the time to give some degree of improvement, okay? So my sense would be probably go ahead and give the prescription antibiotics a try. All right. All right. Good luck to you. All right. So, all right, let's see here. This is part one of about three parts of this question from Michelle. It says, um, Michelle says, I'm 65 and been treating for Lyme disease for 15 years. I'm doing better last year and now this problem started six months ago. Uh, currently I'm using Cascon Atoba Bark extract to prevent relapse. The thing is, Michelle, I don't know what the question was. 
I, I don't see a question in that, so I, I can't answer it right now, okay? All right, now I'm gonna tell everyone, this is odd. I've just about gotten through all the questions tonight. So we have about another 25 minutes here. So if you still have other questions, write them, or I may be ending the webinar early tonight, all right? Um, the Vicinjis would like that. Um, I would like that. I get home to eat a little bit sooner, but uh, I'm here for another 25 minutes. So if you have other questions to ask, go ahead and do it, because we're literally have almost gone through all the questions for tonight, okay? All right, so let's see. This is a question from Joyce. Hello, Joyce. Let's see, are glutathione and or ATP360 able to be used with a G2? Thank you. I think they can be. The thing I would do, though, is you don't want to put them in as thick as they are. I would try to mix them in some liquid, stir it up. Uh, probably something that has a little oil in it, so they blend a little bit better in liquid before you put it down, okay? Now, I can't guarantee it. I've never used it in a G2, but the thing with the, with this stuff is it's so thick and slip, slip, uh, so thick and dense that you definitely would want to try to, to make it less dent, thick and dense by mixing it up in something liquid and making it more liquid uh, before you try that, okay? All right. Thanks for that question. Let's see. Right, this is from Lauren. Once a patient comes to you, are you able to prescribe pharmaceuticals from afar? The answer is yes, I can prescribe across state borders. Again, I wanna see somebody in my office at least two times a year and the other visits we can do by telemedicine video, um, okay? Bear with me here, everyone. I'm just trying to get rid of some things that are blocking my view of the other questions. All right. All right. Renee, Renee asks, what are your thoughts about Morgellons? So Morgellons, everyone, is a skin condition that we people get these lesions that just keep showing up that sometimes have filaments coming out of them. They're itchy and so they scratch and then and more filaments come out and no one really knows what it is, all right? So there have been studies done about these filaments. We can't identify what they are. There's been studies done looking to see what might be causing these skin problems and infections. We can't identify what the kind of infection is. The thing that we do know about Morgellons is about 90% of the time that somebody has Morgellons, if we do testing for Lyme, we see that they have Lyme disease. The other 10% are people that have HIV or AIDS, all right? So it appears that people get the skin condition called Morgellons actually have an underlying uh, immunosuppressive illness, something that really dramatically suppresses the immune system. Why it manifests this way, I don't think we know at this point. Now, things that have sulfur in them, and sulfur is in terms of topical agents, sometimes can help. And sulfur antibiotics sometimes can help as well, too. But ultimately, the way that we treat, that I have found most benefit in treating for Morgellons is to treat the underlying Lyme. And as you get Lyme under control, often the Morgellons is going to respond as well, too. Okay? Those are just some general thoughts about it. Okay. Thanks for that question. Hello, Margaret. Let's see. Some people I know have been helped by FSM, frequency specific microcurrents. What is your opinion? So I have seen those be helpful for certain kind of pain kind of conditions. I have not seen them to be helpful for the overall Lyme, uh, uh, all the conditions seen in Lyme disease, but more for like muscle and joint pain, I have seen benefit. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question.
Hello, Kathy again. Let's see, do you have any experience with the amp coil or the Wave 2? Not with either one of those specifically. I have had experience with Rife machines and doing something called a Doug coil. Uh, Rife machines is basically an electromagnetic frequency machine that generates electromagnetic frequencies that vibrate with the germ to burst it, okay? And those type of machines seem to help about 30 to 40% of people based on my experience, but also based on the findings of uh, my Lyme data, which is a Lyme disease um, data um, collection research project using something called big data, where people with Lyme uh, allow questions to be answered to them and data to be collected. And they did a study on benefits of alternative treatments. And in that study, people that have had rifing report about 30 to 40% report some improvements on that. Okay, all right. Thanks for the question. Hello, Eileen, let's see. My daughter has Lyme and was diagnosed with Candida via blood test. How would you recommend treating it? Thanks so much for all your help for so long. So if they diagnosed based on blood tests, probably they were seeing that she has antibodies in her blood against Candida. And in my opinion, that's not accurate. Sorry to say that. Okay, so we have yeast that live in our intestines. And so our immune system and, and just trying to keep yeast under control, even in healthy people, might develop antibodies. So just seeing antibodies in the blood does not mean that yeast are growing too much, okay? So the way that I like to figure out if yeast are growing too much is I like to do a screening questionnaire, and I'll show that to you here in a minute. And if people, they, they it looks at your risk factors for too many yeast in the intestines, and it looks at the symptoms that can suggest too many yeast, and if you have a lot of these, then it suggests you've got yeast overgrowth, okay? So if you score over 140, then I find it beneficial to treat for systemic yeast. There is another way to see if you have systemic yeast that might be most accurate, and that is to do something called an organic acid test. And on that, you pee urine, and we're looking for organic acids in there. And we're looking to see if somebody is uh, making large amounts of something called arabinose, okay? And uh, if they make a lot of arabinose, then that can suggest yeast is overgrowing in the intestine, not just living there, but growing too much, okay? Because again, even healthy people have yeast living in their intestines. It doesn't mean that they're overgrowing, they just cohabitate there. So measuring antibodies does not tell us whether they're growing too much, okay? All right, so, um, so if she truly does have yeast overgrowth, there's a number of ways you could treat for yeast overgrowth. Um, and I have a whole pro plan about that. The prescription ways I like to do it is to combine something called Diflucan, 200 milligrams one time a day for about 30 days, along with Nystatin, two pills twice a day for about four months. And then also, and just the Nystatin for four months, not the Diflucan, okay? And then use probiotics, okay? That's my preferred way. There's herbal options you can use as well too. And if you do the herbal option at Capri Plus that I mentioned earlier, two pills twice a day, coupled with lots of probiotics can be helpful too. Let me show you an article that you can look at that gives a lot more detail, okay? Let's see here. Take a look in my infection treatment plan section here. And then take a look at this article called Kills Yeast, A Brief Guide. And within here, I give you lots of options to go after those yeast, okay? All right. All right. Thanks for your question, Eileen. Hello, Karen. Let's see, what do you think of the Buner protocol for Bartonella? So I like the Buner protocol for Bartonella, especially two components of it. Those two components are Siddha Okuda and Hutania. I use those two herbs as part of my Bartonella treatment protocol, okay? Now, Buner in his protocol doesn't just talk about germ killing. He talks about balancing your adrenals. He talks about doing immune support. 
my whole Ross Lyme support protocol is devoted to immune support, lowering cytokines, and um, supporting the adrenals, all right? So I find using Siddha Akuta and Hutania, along with the other steps in the Ross Lyme support protocol, is going to work better for you than what the Buner protocol is going to work, okay? All right. So let me just show that to you here real quick. All right, so my treatment protocol is right here at this treatment protocol. This is my the Ross Lyme support protocol. And basically all steps of it help support your immune system. So number one, I say get sleep and I recommend how to do it. Number two, I recommend some diets that I find helpful with Lyme. Number three, I recommend knocking down inflammation cytokines that are made by the immune system because that can help your immune system work better. Number four, I recommend being on something called an adaptogen. I like ashwagandha for that. Number five, I talk about some basic steps you can use to help your hormone systems work better. That helps the immune system work better. Number six, be in a good multivitamin. Number seven, do some basic detox steps, especially use some glutathione. Number eight, exercise if you can, if, if you can tolerate it. Don't do any specific immune boosters other than those steps I said above. Get yeast out if it's there. And then down here, treat Lyme. And then I mentioned treating co-infections, the Bartonella. And here I talk about the Hutania and the Siddha Okuda, okay? So all those steps collectively boost the immune system so you can get Bartonella out. And I find it to be a more effective program than the Buner protocol. Although Buner and I agree on two things, Siddha Okuda and Hutania. Okay. All right. Thank you for that question. Hello, Molly. I see I'm currently taking azithromycin and I'm going to start rifampin this week and I'm kind of nervous. I read it can be pretty harsh. Your thoughts. All right, so rifampin, I like using rifampin. Um, rifampin is gonna turn your urine orange. It's a side effect of it, okay? Rifampin has a very long side effect list. I mean, if you go to the pharmacy, they're gonna give you that wad of papers that they always do with all the potential side effects and rifampin looks horrible. The truth is I only see people have a, um, have side effects that are that we need to stop the medicine for about 5% of the time. 95% of people can tolerate rifampin. Now rifampin sometimes can give some significant Herxheimer reactions, okay? And if you're concerned about that, start low. So normally I wanna have people on 600 milligrams one time a day, but it comes as a 300 milligram pill. So you can start with one pill a day for a week and see how you're gonna tolerate it first, okay? All right, good luck to you. Hello, B. Let's see. I know a paleo diet is desirable. I'm no on. Um, let's see. I'm no gluten, no dairy, no dairy, no sugar. Is this just? <coughs> is this just to reduce inflammation, or are these substances able to feed Lyme germs? This is the paleo diet is just to reduce inflammation, and it helps support your energy factories called mitochondria work better. Okay. In no way is any are any of these substances you're removing actually feeding the Lyme germ, okay? All right, thanks for the question, B. Lauren, you're welcome. Hello, Lisa. See, hi, Dr. Ross. So I got a prescription for methylene brew from Lyme Doctor from a specialty compounding pharmacy, 50 milligrams liposomal capsules. Same pharmacy also will do disulfiram. Pharmacy said lots of orders. Thoughts on either or both for BART. So um, the methylene blue is more helpful for um, people that are using um, a medicine called Dapsone. It helps reduce some of the side effect issues that people see with Dapsone. I would not think it's something that's going to be useful for treating Bartonella. Okay, Dapsone is a medicine that we can use to treat uh, Lyme and maybe even Babesia. Okay, Disulfiram, um, 
so that most dog so disulfiram has good clinical evidence that shows it could treat babesia and treat a Lyme. Some of my colleagues are saying that they're seeing some results with Bartonella. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know about that yet. I haven't tried it to see if it's going to give Bartonella results or not. Okay. That would be my comment. I'm just starting to use it clinically here in my patients at the practice. In fact, I, I wrote my first disulfiram prescription this week. Okay. All right. So thank you for that question. No. Hello, Bill. Hi, Marty. Have you had any of your patients try any Hopper's dynamic neuro retraining system? Lyme is on the list of syndromes that uh, DNRS can help. So I have had some patients that have done that. They tend to be patients that we're treating. We're just not getting anywhere. We're having a harder time. It's one of those things I think that can be helpful in some people. Um, and so, yeah, I, so I would say yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Elizabeth, yes, I am. I've just started uh, using Antabuse for my Lyme patients. I will tell you there's a national shortage right now. I think many of you know about it. I've got a few compounding sources and what we're starting to understand is that some of the pharmacies are starting to get the medicine back again. But it is one of the alternatives I am looking at and discussing with my patients as they come in to see me again. So yes, I am. Thanks for that question. Mary, Mary, Mary says you are the best. I appreciate that, Mary. Thank you. Oops, B, I forgot to show you the questionnaire for yeast. Hold on here just a minute. All right, so for the yeast questionnaire, there's two places you can find it. You can look on this. Is, or, so right now we're in my Lyme support protocol. And if you look at the yeast section down here within the yeast section, in this section here, why these treatment help, I have the yeast screening questionnaire. You just click on that and it will pull it up for you. Okay, so that's the yeast screening questionnaire. The other place you could find it um, is just uh, is to look into my article about how do you diagnose yeast, and you can find that in the yeast chapter. And then uh, this article called A Silent Problem, Is It Yeast? And then uh, within this, you can find my yeast screening questionnaire. There's the link to it right there, okay? All right. Hello, John. Hi, Dr. Ross. I've been having horrible GI problems. Is it Lyme triggered? It could be, but it may also have due to just an interruption of the good bacteria load in the intestines, which could result in pancreas problems, which could result in absorption problems, could result in a whole host of things. This is something I would try to talk to your doctor about, especially a doctor that does more functional medicine that has the ability to evaluate the gut, to figure out what the function of the gut is and what the balance of good or bad bacteria is in the gut as well too. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, John. Hello, Linda. Let's see. Thanks for answering my other question. You're welcome. Also, love to know what you recommend to improve fatigue. Rifampin causes me great fatigue, and in the past, also have had to stop taking it, but want to persist. Also, of reducing cytokines, is there any concern about reducing body's immune response too much? How to know? Thank you. Um, my experience is, I mean, it's a good question about reducing the immune response too much. I just haven't seen it happen. So, I, I, you know, basically we're fighting a losing battle in some ways with all those excess cytokines and e even using the herbs, I don't think we're going to knock them down too far. Okay, that's my opinion on that. In terms of fatigue, um, two things. Consider using the ashwagandha that I talk about, which is an adaptogen, helps the body deal with stress and can improve energy. 
it's a 400 milligram pill and you'd want to do two pills in the morning and two pills between one and two. The other thing I would suggest you take a look at is um, efforts that I write about to repair your mitochondria energy factory. And that would be to use something um, that repairs the covering like an NT factor, ATP 360 or ATP fuel and couple that with glutathione, okay? So we're running short on time now, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you that article so you can take a look at it on your own. All right, so the article, so take a look at my guide and then look in the energy and fatigue chapter and then look at this one about how to fix mitochondria energy, okay? All right. All right, thanks for your question, Linda. Let's see. Also, you mentioned that minocycline gets deeper into fatty tissues so it crosses the blood brain barrier. Does that also mean it gets deeper into the fat under the skin where Bartonella seems to be wreaking havoc on the legs? Good question. I don't know. It might. It might. I know that there's good studies that show it does penetrate the brain bed, though. Okay. All right. Thanks for our question, Linda. Hello, Mary. Let's see. We had our online visit a month ago. One of the best days of my life. You and your website info is the holy grail. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I hope you're doing better. Thank you for that comment. All right. So that's it for me tonight, everyone. Um, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I will be off next week as I'm doing some personal travel. Um, in the middle of the week. I'm actually here seeing patients for a couple of days, but then I, I head out. And, um, and But I will be with you in two weeks. So tomorrow, you're going to get an email from me first thing, well, first thing in my morning, but maybe it's going to be your afternoon by the time it gets to you on the East Coast. And so that's going to have a description of what we talked about tonight. And then uh, we'll have a link to where you find the video. In that email will also be a link to sign up for the next webinar, which is two weeks out from now. Okay. Um, so have a good couple of weeks, everyone, and I hope to see you back here in two weeks. Good night, everyone.